State Circle is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Lawmakers consider mandatory sentences for repeat offenders. You know, we're trying to find that balance. We want it to be focused on those who are using guns to commit crimes. Locking the box on casino revenue. For those local school systems, it'll get more efficient, that will accelerate school construction, school repair. We'll give them more state money in the project. They're going to put the money in the education fund. They'll put in $500 million from casinos in the education fund, and they'll slide $500 million out to something else. And how to unwind a stealth tax increase. We're not proposing anything that would take more money out of the state. Connecting Marylanders to their government. This is State Circle. Good evening. The big story around State Circle this week is a crackdown on crime. After a year of record homicides and drug overdoses, Governor Hogan is proposing tougher sentences for repeat offenders. Details on that from Charles Robinson. This year, let's crack down on those violent criminals who use guns to commit crimes by passing tougher minimum sentences. The get tough approach isn't a new idea from the governor. Statistically, police will tell you some of the most violent offenders are repeat offenders. The rubber met the road this week in the Senate Judiciary Committee. A pair of administration bills try and address the issue. Senate Bill 199, known as the Accountability for Violent Criminal Acts, would impose longer terms for individuals with life sentences before they become eligible for parole. It would also make certain crimes ineligible for parole. The other bill is SB 197, which would impose different sentences for crimes committed with guns. Instead of serving time concurrently for multiple offenses, they would be implemented consecutively. The intent of this bill is very clear. It's to go after violent offenders who use firearms to commit crimes, particularly those who do so repeatedly. I assume the governor's targeting this is a lot of the, the violence and, and murder in Baltimore has been the result of people, drug trafficking and, and carrying guns, correct? Right. So we want to narrowly tailor this. Again, it's a statewide bill, but we want it to be focused on those who are using guns to commit crimes. I think it is foolhardy to think on the back end you're just going to warehouse and, uh, tens of thousands of people forever, and that's going to stop it. You know, we're trying to find that balance. You know, everybody believes in second chances, and we want to give people second chances, but we also want to make sure that our, our, our citizens are safe. Mandatory minimum sentencing is not an effective strategy. The proof is in the pudding from the mistakes that we've made over the years. Similar bills are being heard in the House. The legislature passed the Adjustment Reinvestment Act in 2016 to right-size how the criminal justice system dealt with violent and nonviolent offenders. Republicans will point to Project Exile, which was implemented in Richmond, Virginia. It mandated mandatory minimums for crimes committed with guns. It's embraced by the administration. Crime and punishment in the legislature is always a balancing act. On the one hand, you want to send a message to repeat offenders that this will not be tolerated. Conversely, those who need a second chance should be afforded one. In Annapolis, I'm Charles Robinson for State Circle. Gun laws are again up for debate this year. Legislators will consider a ban on bump stocks, which were used in the Las Vegas massacre, and they may change the process for appeals of handgun permit decisions. Nancy Yamada has more. Governor Hogan and several other lawmakers joined the dozens of hunters who descended on Annapolis for its annual Blaze and Camo Day. They want their rights protected and their voices heard regarding several gun bills that are closely being followed by members of the Maryland Hunting Coalition. Among them, a bill to ban bump stocks and other firearm accessories that are designed to increase the rate of fire of designated firearms. It will affect hunters because of the way that the bills crafted the 
talks about interchanging parts. You know, we put parts in our in our firearms all the time. For example, I have what's called a Remington 1187. It's a semi-automatic firearm I use for waterfowl. And every now and then, there's a little O-ring in the cylinder that I have to change because it gets worn down. So this bill would impact me just on that. Maryland already has a sweeping ban on military-style guns and high-capacity magazines. But months after the Las Vegas mass shooting, more states, including Maryland, are looking to ban the sale of bump stocks. Well, we're here to protect the general public. You know, we're not taking guns away from sportsmen in any sense of the matter. We are here trying to protect the families, the children, and everyone else that live here and want to live in safe communities. And we don't want anyone making a semi-automatic weapon into an automatic weapon. And it's unfortunately the case that a lot of us were uh, hearing vague promises that the federal government and ATF might tackle this issue, but once again, they have not. Delegate David Moon, the measure's lead sponsor in the House, says it's time for Maryland to close the loophole in the state's assault weapons ban. I want to be very clear that I do not see this as a monumental change to gun laws in Maryland, but it is a simple statement that we're saying today that you cannot jerry-rig your way around our assault weapons ban uh, using technologies. Democrats are introducing another bill which would repeal the handgun permit review board, a five-member panel appointed by the governor. Though no firm statistics were cited, the Democrats claim that ever since Governor Hogan took office three years ago, there's been a noticeable surge in the number of concealed carry permits that were granted to people who were initially denied. We need to have these appeals go to the Office of Administrative Hearings where professional judges can make decisions about whether or not someone should have a permit using standards that are consistent across the board. To that end, Governor Hogan's response? Handgun Permit Review Board, why they would want to do away with a board that they created, I'm not quite sure, but neither one of these uh, pieces of legislation uh, are going to have much of an impact on Maryland. Even so, Governor Hogan says he is willing to look at legislation banning bump stocks, even as opponents say the bill will not go a long way toward improving public safety. Well, it's a little tiresome to see all these proposals that don't affect the number of folks who are killed in Baltimore. Long, this this uh, legislation is aimed at uh, long guns, which are used almost never by criminals. We sit in, in judicial proceedings committee on a day-to-day -day basis and constantly ask folks, where's the data that shows that people who are lawfully in possession of firearms are committing the killings? It's not happening. I'm Nancy Yamada for State Circle. The legislature is moving quickly on an issue that had been stalled for nearly a decade, parental rights and cases of rape. I'm glad we're passing it for the ninth time, and I hope the House steps up to the plate and gets it out and gets it on the governor's desk. No woman, no victim should ever, ever, if she's been raped, have to deal with first the rape and then having to, as they say, negotiate with rapists. That's an outrageous assumption, obviously. Has ever recorded the vote? Anyone wish to change the vote? Anyone wish to explain the vote? If not, the clerk will take the call. Senate Bill 2, having received a unanimous vote, having received 45 votes in front of zero in the negative, is ordered passed for third reading. Governor Hogan has promised to sign the bill when it reaches his desk. Well, is it a lockbox or a shell game? There is disagreement over a proposal to hardwire casino revenues into the education budget. Yolanda Vasquez reports. They say to us, everywhere we go, what about, what about the promise you made about gambling revenues going to education? It's a question these State House Democrats plan to address with their Fix the Fund initiative. Our first priority to the citizens of Maryland is K through 12 education system. Everybody in every community across the state identifies with our school system. The bill, which is being drafted by House Appropriations Chair Delegate Maggie McIntosh, would put a lockbox on casino money, requiring it to be used to enhance school funding formulas. We have to renew our commitment to our number one constitutional duty, and that is to provide an adequate education for the school children of, of uh, this state. 
The $500 million from casino gaming would be phased in over four years so the state can make budget adjustments. The new legislation comes at a time when Maryland's national education ranking slips from number one to number six. The entire time uh, the prior administration was talking about Maryland schools being number one, uh, a lot of us looked at each other, you know, and thought, I don't know about that. Delegate Nick Kipke has always been skeptical of the state's high ranking. A statement by the governor's press office says state test scores may have been inflated under the previous administration. We had one of the worst SAT scores in the country. Our graduation rates are not where they need to be. And the bottom line is we need honesty in the system. Delegate Herb McMillan also worries about the state's academic performance. As for the Fix the Fund campaign, he says it's nothing more than a shell game. They're going to put the money in the education fund. They'll put in $500 million from casinos in the education fund, and they'll slide $500 million out to something else. And that's exactly what they've done. Senate Bill 92, presented to members of a Senate subcommittee, encourages schools to stretch their funds and keep buildings in better condition. And what this bill says is, for those local school systems, it'll get more efficient, that will accelerate school construction, school repair, we'll give them more state money in the project. Senator Rosapep believes his bill would tackle several issues facing schools and has the backing of two prominent county executives. Those who testified in favor of the bill say it's a concept worth exploring, especially with escalating construction costs. But one county executive said it might be easier to start off with a pilot program. This is such a big issue and very complex that maybe instead of writing a bill that applies to 24 jurisdictions, we should give a county an opportunity to come in with a program see how it works, work with the state, and, and see what kind of savings it produces. Two initiatives legislative leaders are gambling on as the state's education system tries to regain its top-tier ranking. In Annapolis, I'm Yolanda Vasquez for State Circle. This week, Republicans unveiled legislation to offset the effects of the new federal tax law, which will indirectly cause state taxes to rise for some Marylanders. Both parties agree that this session lawmakers should come up with a plan to shield state residents from higher taxes. Republicans propose delinking the state income tax when it comes to choosing to itemize or take the standard deduction. Some would like to see Maryland's tax rate lowered. If Maryland is known to be a high tax state, why wouldn't this be a great opportunity for us to actually lower our rates and yet be revenue neutral? We're not proposing anything that would take more money out of the state. We're just saying, as the governor has said, and we're supporting his initiative that says, when there's federal action that causes a windfall to the state, we should make sure that we hold the citizens of the state harmless. The comptroller estimates the state treasury will collect an extra $400 million if no changes are made. Our newsmaker this week is Major General Linda Singh, the Adjutant General of the Maryland National Guard. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me today. Good to see you. The, the governor has named you to chair a commission on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. How, how do you see that mission? Well, I, I think that it's really important for us to continue to think about um, all of the women that came before us, and not just women, but also men, those shoulders that we've stood on. And so this allows me the opportunity to help educate some of our young individuals, but really help to bring back and celebrate all the progress that we've made and to really celebrate the lives of all of the individuals that has some part in where we are today, the progress. Um, I wouldn't even be in the military if it wasn't for some of what these women have done and what some of the men have done. So to me, it's extremely important. Not to mention being the, the first woman to command the, the Maryland Guard. When, when you think back about the, the 19th Amendment, and, and it's, it's hard from 2018 to imagine that there was even a debate about this, but certainly there was. How, how do you see the impact in terms of uh, women's uh, suffrage and, and beyond that? Well, I think, um, you know, as I mentioned, we have made a lot of progress, but we still have a lot further to go. And when I think about 
where things are today, it's extremely important for us to embrace um, the impact that women have on our overall lives. And it starts from very small, when you start with your mother and how they actually raise us and bring us into the world. And then when you think about the, the model, the role model that they set for us, and then other women. And so when I think about what the, the 19th Amendment really means, it's it's really getting beyond the counting the numbers, but it's about celebrating and being thankful. But then it's also t for us, someone like myself, being able to turn the leads over to someone more junior, looking at that future generation. And how are they going to be leaders uh, much into the future will be very different than what we are in terms of leaders today. Well, what kind of uh, commemoration is this commission working on? Because when I take a quick look, uh, back at history, I believe that Maryland was not exactly in the forefront, uh, certainly on, on approving the, the constitutional amendment. So w what's on the table in terms of how this will be commemorated? And the anniversary, I think, is 2020. That's correct. So the anniversary is 2020. So we're looking at having a number of events leading up to that within Maryland that highlights all of the important places. So we'll be putting out markers, roadside markers that will actually highlight important places that took place uh, during the, the 19th Amendment. And even though Maryland wasn't necessarily one of the first states that signed, um, they were very, very active during that time frame. And so we want to highlight our history there. And when we think about the events, we have an event coming up on March 3rd in Hyattsville, which is an extremely important one, where we're going to be placing uh, a marker in the, in the city of Hyattsville and kind of celebrating as a kickoff event right before International Women's Day. And then if I was to think about um, where we go from there, it's having more of those events, it's having more educational events, and then leading up to what I would like to see a very large international um, I say an international, but looking at with partnering with D.C., Pennsylvania, and some of the other states that were very key on the on the eastern border of um, what happened during the 19th Amendment, for us to kind of partner and really have a very big march that would lead up to that, and it's really a celebration march. And I and I would say it's not just marching, but it's having educational events where we could really look at what does it mean to be a woman leader in today's environment? Uh, what will it mean for the future generation? Because um, it's, it's great to be able to look at the past, but what's important is what do we as women leaders do today to, to actually um, help to set up that future generation for success? From a, a personal standpoint, and, and many people know your, your personal story, uh, great success, obviously, in the, in the military, but also in the corporate world after a, a, a difficult start in, in life. Right. When, when you talk to, to young people under your command, particularly women, what's your message in, in general and, and in the context of, of service in the Guard? Well, I mean, my message to, to women um, is very similar to my message to men, is that you got to be competent. You have to be confident in your skills and ability. You have to show up every single day. Because regardless of whether you're a man or a woman, if you don't show up every single day, then you're not going to achieve the level of success. And so to me, getting those messages across is extremely important, but also valuing diversity. And it's more than just diversity of how someone looks. It's valuing the diversity of their capabilities and the fact that just because they're different than you are does not make them any less of a capable leader. And so it's really stressing that and stressing how we can be um, teaming partners to be able to deliver on a solution. And those are the types of things that I focus in on. Lastly, uh, for uh, 2018 status of the, uh, the Maryland uh, National Guard, the Maryland Air Guard, what, what are the priorities for this year? So our priorities, as, as always, continues to be readiness. We have a, a number of exercises coming up this year where we're focusing in on our homeland mission, mission as well as um, our deployment-type missions that we have coming up. And so individual readiness is our first and most important priority. And so part of my responsibility is to, is to ensure that my leadership understands that we have to have every single soldier and airman 
ready. As you can see, you know, last year was very challenging for a number of states. We've had very unusual weather patterns. And so the National Guard responds uh, a lot on those fronts. And so we really do need to be there for our citizens to make sure that we are personally and individually ready. Major General Linda Singh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. And we're back with a political roundtable right after this. We are the curious. Wow. <laughs> the adventurous. Oh. Those venturing out for the first time. <laughs> and those who never lost our sense of wonder. We are the hungry, Bookie. the strong, I must be the, greatest. the joyful, a happy little cloud. We believe there is always more we can uncover, more we can explore. We believe in the capacity for goodness and the potential for greatness. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. PBS. 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 Governor Hogan delivered the annual State of the State Address this week. It was the final one of this term and a chance for the governor to sound some potential campaign themes. Just after I took the oath of office, I said to those who would drive us to the extremes of either party, let me remind you that Maryland has always been a state of middle temperament. I asked that we seek that middle ground where we can all stand together. And ladies and gentlemen, over the past three years, we have. Together, we have put Maryland on a new and better path. And we cannot afford to turn back now. And joining us from the State House this week, reporter Rachel Bay of WYPR Radio. Rachel, thanks for being with us. Let's start with the, the state of the state, your, your impressions of, of the speech. It, it was definitely a speech that emphasized bipartisanship. It, it felt a lot like a campaign speech, honestly. Um, in contrast with some past years, there was a little bit less talk about policy initiatives and more talk about what the governor has done over the last three years of his term here in Annapolis. So we saw Republicans jumping to their feet to applaud. We saw Democrats at times applauding, at times uh, not. Uh, what did Democrats have to say after the speech? So Democrats were really critical, really critical of the speech, primarily in terms of what Hogan didn't discuss. So uh, a couple of Baltimore legislators, for example, said, you know, Baltimore was only mentioned once, and that was in relation to the port of Baltimore. They, uh, the governor didn't talk about a lot of Baltimore-specific uh, issues. And there were also talks about the Black, uh, Legislative Black Caucus leader, Cheryl Glenn, uh, said that they didn't, that uh, pointed out that Governor Hogan didn't talk about medical marijuana, which is their top priority issue. Um, even within the things that he did talk about, Democrats were quick to point out uh, that he, that the governor left out key things that they would have wanted to hear. They, they really were looking for uh, pretty much any point that they could criticize the governor on, given that, again, it is an election year, and this was a, it was a, an opportunity to really display uh, partisan divides in that way. You know, talking to a, a lot of people in the press room uh, there after the speech, the consensus was it was not, it, it was sort of businesslike. It was not a, a barn burner kind of speech. There was an editorial in The Sun this week that took note of that and said that perhaps that was another way of differentiating Governor Hogan and his state of the state from President Trump and his state of the union, which had happened just hours earlier. Right. And, and you know, it, it is remarkable that uh, of all the Democrats I spoke with, very few actually criticized 
um, what Hogan did say. It was really, the criticism was what was left out of the speech because what was in the speech was really, um, he, the governor bookended the speech with discussion of uh, bipartisanship and, and specifically contrasted Annapolis with Washington in terms of tr striving for that bipartisan uh, bipartisanship here in Annapolis. Well, speaking of differences between Washington and Annapolis, uh, this week, Attorney General Brian Frosch announced that he will be uh, suing the federal government, uh, critical of the legality of the new federal tax law. What's the complaint? Yeah, the complaint, uh, and, and I, I haven't spoken with uh, Attorney General Frosch specifically about this complaint, but, but in the past, when this possibility was raised, uh, there was discussion of joining the, the suit that Governor Cuomo in New York has, has mentioned. Uh, and it's really an argument about equal uh, applicability to the states, that the, the, specifically the cap on the state and local tax deduction uh, affects certain states differently than it affects other states. Governor Hogan uh, revealed this week that uh, this weekend he gets to go to the dermatologist to have some uh, pretty basic uh, skin cancer work, some uh, relatively minor things removed. Um, what do we know about this? And, and we don't believe in, in just 30 seconds that this is connected at all to his previous treatment for lymphoma. No, it's it's not at all connected to his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, he emphasized that this is very minor. It's basal and squamous cell uh, carcinoma. Uh, and it's non-melanoma. It's supposed to be a very quick procedure, he says. Uh, and he expects to be back at work on Monday. Well, we hope everything works out well for the governor this weekend. Rachel Bay, WYPR. You can hear her at 88.1. You can read her reports at WYPR.org. Rachel, thanks for making time for us. My pleasure. That is our program for this week. Tune in every week at this time as we bring the State House to your house. You can also connect with State Circle online. Streaming videos of our programs can be found at video.mpt.tv. Monday on Direct Connection, expert advice on preventing and treating heart disease. Join us for that Monday at 7. Now for all of us at MPT, I'm Jeff Salkin. Thanks for watching and have a good night. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities. TV Worth Watching is supported by the members of MPT and by... The University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science welcomes new president, Dr. Peter Goodwin, guiding our state, nation, and world toward a more sustainable future. Find out more at umces.edu. At Caswick, our adult day program is tailored to each individual. With a registered nurse, social worker, dietitian, and therapist on staff, your family member will be part of a highly engaging memory care program that treats both mind and body. Learn more at choosecaswick.org. Artworks is MPT's weekly 